Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome yet again to the Tower UNN. Uh, we're grateful to be here with you today. We're grateful we get to see another Sunday. We're grateful that we get to be here as well, present to you matters of national concern, discuss them back and forth with you. As you can see today, we're going to be talking about the ADF, which is the Allied Democratic Forces. And that is a group that has been labeled as a terrorist and rebel group in Uganda. But before we get into the gist of today's topic, I also have a guest in the studio, Senior Chintu is going to be here with us today. But we're going to do everything accordingly and accord of course within tradition of how we do it every Sunday. First, we will listen to the national anthem. And right after the national anthem, we will listen to a state anthem. So I will ask the producer to please play the national anthem first. Oh, you God, I may God up holy. We lay our future in thy hand. United, free. Welcome back from the National Anthem and at this point in time I would like to introduce our guest uh, Senior Chintu to come and give his greetings but before we get into that I would like to actually introduce today's state anthem we're going to be listening to the state anthem of Renzuru region which borders which is one of the regions in Uganda that borders with the Congo but before we go into the anthem, I'd like to pass the mic over to Senior Chin to send his greetings and regards. Uh, greetings to you, Desire. Greetings to all of you who are listening and watching us on this beautiful day of Sunday. Uh, it is a great privilege and the honor for us to be here and expose some of the facts that are behind what is making our country and the entire Great Lakes region bleed to death. And it is our duty and responsibility and a concern that we expose those who are behind the suffering of our people who have produced so much death in the region in the tune of more than 15 million people. 15 million innocent people in Uganda Rwanda and the Congo in particular. So we are here and we are going to expose some of their data tricks. We hope that you will pay attention and listen attentively and learn from it. And from that learning, you will know what you are supposed to do to save our region. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Senior Chintu, for that. Well, we'll proceed with the state anthem. I would like to ask the producer to please play the Renzuri state anthem. Samari 
flying uh, in that video of that anthem and a representation that really we can go back to the indigenous groups of Uganda in state formation and still have unity and collaboration as a nation. But uh, right after this anthem, I wanted to ask Senior Chintu to explain to the audience why we actually chose to do uh, the Renzuri State Anthem and why it is within the same, the same it's within the same topics that we're going to be covering today. Yes, thank you very yes. much, Desire. We chose the Renzururu anthem because the people of Renzururu in Uganda, we call them Wabakonjo. In, mm -hmm. in Congo, they call them the Nandis. The colonial border cut through this state or this nation of Banandi Bakonjo and they gave them two different names depending upon which side of the border they are but by the way you should know that the majority of this ethnic group is within the Congo area more than in, inside Uganda but their king is the same who resides in Kasese, who was captured by the Tusi regime of Yoweri Museveni, and who is now suffering under incarceration in Kampala. So because of the suffering of his people who reside on the other side of the Congo, more than the, I don't mean that the, the Bakonjo in Uganda have not suffered. No, that's not what I mean. But the, the atrocities we are going to talk about have befallen more on those people who reside within Congo, whose land is being coveted by the Tusi marauding invaders who are now taking over that land from the indigenous people. That's why we chose that anthem. I've had it before, but I was not sure whether the 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 king covered both regions across the border because we usually just see that as the king of Renzururu and related to Kasese but forget that colonial borders have actually created uh, a distant memory for indigenous groups cutting through borders separating peoples and separating lands so in order to get into what we're going to talk today if maybe we can uh, i can break it down for the audience we're going to be looking at the allied democratic forces uh which is we all understand that towards independence once african nations started getting independence uh this also involved taking arm um, and guerrilla warfare which left uganda in uh, in conditions of uh 
hand uh what is what are they called gate one gatekeeper to the next one gatekeeper to the next where we find ourselves with museveni in 1986 uh taking credit for the for, for the guerrilla warfare that had happened and coming up to presidency but still the vacuum was opened for a lot of a lot more future guerrilla groups to come on the rise so adf happens to be one of them that came onto the rise but before we get into that, Mrs. Chinjo, I wanted us to actually play a video. I wanted to ask the producer to play a video of when uh, the leader of ADF was arrested and what was said and where we stand as of today in order to put things into perspective where those charges are and how this case is being handled nationally. According to the charges which have been read in court by the registrar, Sanyo Harriet Lukwago, the indictment introduces Jamil Mukulu as the lead of ADF and the Salaf Muslim community in Uganda, who would give orders to his 37 co-accused to commit murders and robberies in various districts like Bujiri, Tororo, Namayingo, Kampala, Wakiso, Jinja, Mbali and Budaka. Mukulu is also indicted for the murders of two sheikhs, Dr. Makwaya Yunus, Abubeka Mandanga, in Mayuge and Bujili district respectively, and the murder of two police officers, Muzami Lubare and Karim Tenua from Bujili police station. <laughs> the group is further said to have robbed guns, ammunition, a gold weighing machine, millions of shillings in addition to attempting to kill many people. Prosecution led by Assistant DPP John Baptist Asimwe contends that Mukulu and his co-accused committed these offenses for either a social, political, economic or religious aim in order to instill fear and panic among members of the public and government at large. However, according to the rules of the court, Mukulu and his co-accused are not permitted to enter plea on any of the charges as this will be done before a panel of three justices at the commencement of the trial. The suspects have now been further remanded to Luzira prison until Judge Eva Ruswata determines whether the DPP has sufficient evidence to sustain the charges before she confirms them and forwards the case file to the trial panel. Aaron Mukama, NTV Weekend Edition. So as we stand today, uh, I think that the question for this uh, for this show came up with the question of what is actually happening with the leaders such as uh, Jamil that were caught and they were asked not to plea by the by the court and nothing has come up yet in terms of uh, what charges are being laid against them. But however, more evidence is still being searched for. So, Mr. Chitu, when you look at this situation in contrast, like juxtapositioning them amongst each other. On the one side, ADF members and, and members who have been up, actually apprehended are being, are being, the allegations against them are very, very heavy to bring across. But on the other hand, on the contrast, there is still a claim that the court, court is making to a lack, not directly, but it seems like there is a lack of evidence and refusing the accused to even make a plea. So what do we make of this situation? Is it one of those situations yet again where we are forced to be in limbo by the state itself and its operatives and things are not decided decisively or where things go nowhere at all? That's a very good point you've raised. Unfortunately, I have never been to law school. However, I have mm. some common sense. Mm. And <laughs> this kind of this, this kind of scenario mm. it, it depicts a total absence of common sense and the total absence of understanding and the total display of basic human stupidity. Mm. How can you tell us that mm. you have 
information that this is a man who has been leading a group which has committed so many murders and you have mentioned even the individuals who were murdered by this group you have mm -hmm. produced information stating that these people have committed into robbery terrorizing areas robbing funds creating terror in the country to the point of even creating a terror to a, to a country and a government and yet you don't have enough evidence to bring to the judge <laughs> you have to be the biggest idiot ever produced on this planet to say that and that mm. that shows we have this mm. so-called regime which is a regime of barbarians cattle herders cow dung manure cleaners that's all they know they know not, nothing mm. else and they should go back to the viraro and take care of their cattle this is a display of barbaric stupidity two mm. if this man committed this kind of crimes and you really mm. believe he did why do you bring him to a civilian court yet mm. a person who is found in matuga with a red shirt and a red hat and mm -hmm. a, a noob a noob insignia you take him to military martial court mm. second how could you keep a man whom you really believe is such a criminal and you keep him in Ruzira this long and you can't even mm. bring him to the court for final judgment that shows you that your arguments or your statements are no better than what I would call hogwash. Mm. There is something sinister and it is glaring. You can see mm. it very clearly. A glaring sinister behind the arrest of Jamil Mukuru, mm. which they are not revealing. I'll give you a I'll give you an example. Mm. I know of an individual who was arrested in a European country on fictitious charges. But the, the mm. government of that country knew that these cases were concocted by one of their foreign supporters. They arrested this man and they announced that he has been arrested. Instead, mm. they took him to a place whereby he had a one bedroom apartment heavily guarded and well protected well fed they even supplied him whatever he wanted to drink he was actually on a holiday yeah. sitting in that nice comfortable apartment for two years later on they released him and the the people who instigated or demanded his arrest thought that this man was actually arrested but he was in a comfortable place one bedroom apartment with the television all the food he wanted to eat all the drinks he wanted to drink living comfortable comfortably mm -hmm. the only thing that he was deprived of was to roam around the city as he would wish are we playing the same game with mukuru mm -hmm is in a nice comfortable apartment for all these years or not if he had mm. been really such a criminal as they purport him to be you know damn well Museveni's regime would not have spared him the way they mm. didn't spare a person like it, Andrew Kaira or the police officer Kawesa they would not have mm. spared him. So the, even the way he was arrested has a lot of questions which have been have not been answered. You mm. remember he was arrested in Tanzania, in that corridor of Tanzania, which borders with Rwanda. Mm. Now we're going to find out as the evidence we have reveals 
that ADF was sold to Kagame mm. by some leaders of ADF. The amount they sold it is not known yet. Mm. And the agreement between them and Kagame was if you sell to us the name ADF, the way, by the way, recently you, you've been hear, hearing a lot about uh, Chibarama selling NUP to Chagurani group. So mm. some people can sell the name, which in this case they did. They sold the name of ADF to Kagame, and Kagame lied to them that if they sell the name, is eventually going to assist them in their long-term plan of overthrowing Museveni. For them, they thought it was wonderful because, by the way, you know very well, there are many groups who have been trying, and they are still trying, to overthrow Museveni by any means necessary. And any good Ugandan will believe or believes this is the only alternative people have to get rid of this bastard. And I'm calling him a bastard because that's not the word I would want to use, but I'm copying from Mr. Robert Amsterdam, who used it in just recently in the Noop Convention in Holland. He called him a bastard. And I think he was right. The plan of ADF at its inception was to galvanize and mobilize an armed overthrow of Museveni, which, by the way, is the right thing for a Ugandan to do. And anybody with common sense would understand that this is the only option Ugandans have because Museveni told us that he came by the gun, he has to be taken out by the gun. So he gave us the formula. Now, back to ADF, Kagame bought the name and some of the top leaders of, Kaga of ADF at least one of them is comfortably living in Rwanda. Another one is in Kampala. And many others are in other countries, including United Kingdom. The agreement they made was that once they sell the name ADF, and Kagame uses it to do some atrocities in the North Kivu region against the Banandis, you should not make a statement to claim that you are not the one who did it. You have had many, many state statements from both Museveni and the Kagame's governments saying ADF is killing innocent people. And uh, as we already know that the Tutsis are masters of propaganda and lying, they lied to the Kisekedi government that uh, it is the ADF who are killing your people. And therefore, you should allow UPDF to come and help you wipe out these rebels who are killing your people. Kisekedi foolishly fell into that trap and signed a deal with the Museveni and allowed ADF, I mean, allowed UPDF to go into Congo. But ever since the UPDF went into Congo, they have not delivered one rebel fighter, captured or killed. But we already know that they have been involved in slaughtering innocent people. Why are they doing this? I'll tell you, because I found that out just recently. You remember when Kikwete kicked out those truces from Tanzania? They ran into Uganda and the finalists went to Kigali, and um, Kagame figured out where are we going to put these people. He decided that we are going to send them to North Kivu, where they can settle and graze their cattle. But in order to do that, we have to clear that region of the indigenous people who are predominantly the Nandis. They went into the area of um, Bunya, Butembo, and they started slaughtering 
innocent people. I'm talking about the Tutsis who had been kicked out of Tanzania, who settled in, who went to Kigali, and Kagame trained them at a location called, hold on, as I check my notes. He trained them, he set up a training camp in Kagera National Park at a place called um, They were trained in Kagera National Park at a place, uh, I'm going to give you the name of the location, bear with me. M Mutara, that was the training camp. The training camp was in Mutara in Kagera National Park. After that, they were deployed into the Democratic Republic of Congo started killing people in Beni and Ituri. When they kill, they slash and open the abdomen, cut off the heads, totally deform the, the corpse, and leave them there to terrorize the rest of the population. That is why you've been seeing thousands of Banandi running away from their home area into Uganda as refugees. Once they have been pushed out of that region, then the elderly, the women from that group of Batus who were kicked out of Tanzania, move in and occupy the territory. And they settle there as new owners of the land, which is almost the same thing they have done in some of our parts of Uganda. Now, Kagame made this deal with Museveni and bluffed these ADF leaders. And every time they have killed innocent people, you have not had a single former leader of ADF stating that those statements made by the government of Rwanda and Uganda are false because that is part of their agreement when they sold the name. So you have to know this, that the people who are doing the killing of innocent Congolese, particularly the Nandis of that region, are the Tusis who were kicked out of Tanzania, who now go under the name of ADF. There are two different areas, two different groups of Batusi doing the killings of innocent people in Congo. You have the so-called, I would call it the 2C ADF and the M23. M23 is operating in a different area, mostly in Ruchuru. And they are also doing the same thing of killing innocent people. Now, ADF has been, um, M23 has been reinforced with the new battalion is coming in from Rwanda military and the Uganda military. And they are marching according to what we now know. Don't be surprised if they reach Kinshasa and overthrow the government because they are now a full-fledged military force. The, the so-called ADF, which is predominantly Tutsis, is very busy just clearing the grounds for their settlements. Hopefully, sooner or later, they are going to take over the entire Kiev region. And if they take over the entire Kiev region, you know damn well, this is a region which is very rich in minerals. Behind them are the Americans mining companies and the British, Canadian, Australian mining companies. They are helping them in pro false propaganda because all these patrols want is a place to, to graze their cattle and settle. The Muzungus are more interested in what is in the soil. So they have a marriage of two devils. 
I can't even tell which one is male or female, but they are two devils married. And the victims are the Congolese people. You've been muted. Oh, no, you can't hear me even now. I'm not muted. Now I can hear you. Now I can yeah, hear you. I, <laughs> so at, at that point, because a law has been said, but I want us now to go back into it and start taking it out bits by bits so that so that members of our audience and we all can get an understanding because I think you have hit on a lot of very important things just in that introduction of the topic as a whole. So I'm going to start from where you ended because you said something very crucial and important. It's two battalions being sent into the Congo, and their one mission and obligation is to overthrow the government. And we've been hinting at this time, time and time again, how are these groups that are genuinely trying to overthrow repressive governments? Although, of course, ADF is, ADF is reasoning behind which we will get into behind overthrowing Museveni's government is for something also very rudimental. But still, there is a genuine, sincere, sincere attribute to them that they wanted to overthrow Museveni's government, and how they are being bought and turned into now the imperialist cause arm. They are overthrowing governments for resources for the mining companies and to clear and make land for the feudalistic needs of the of the of the, of the Tutsi aristocracy. So if you can elaborate on that more for our audience to understand that these are not just any battalions, they are full outblown warfare raging battalions that have been properly groomed and propagated and put together both by Kagame's government and Museveni's government to always assemble when control of a region is going out of their hands. Well, we have to make a distinction. Mm. The, the first one is the M23, which is 99% mm. Tutsi, mm -hmm. and a fully supported, trained, armed, and supported by Kagame, whom some mm. people call Pirato. The mm. local terminology now, they call him Pirato. Now, that group has been operating in the region Mm. with one purpose, to look mm. for all the Hutus who run away from Rwanda, wherever they are, mm. and they kill them. And they have done that very effectively. They have killed almost 5 million people as of mm. now. Their assignment mm. is to kill Hutu refugees in the camps where they settled after running away in 1994. That is the assignment. That's why I said they are operating particularly in the Ruchuru area where most of those refugee camps were located. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the ADF, we have probably, I could say, the old ADF is the one of Jamil Mukuru and Mukuru. Mm. That is the, you can call that the old ADF, which does not exist mm. anymore. Mm. The new ADF is the one which is owned by Kagame and mm. manned by Tusis, mostly those who were kicked out of Tanzania and others. Mm. Their assignment is just to wipe out indigenous people of North Kivu so that Tusis can settle in that corridor and they call it their mm. home. The way they have settled right. in Ankole, and now they call themselves Banyankore. But look at all of those. Mm. Eh? Look at all of those, including Museven himself. Is he really mm. These people mm. are now settling in this North Kivu of Beni, Ituri, and they are going to call themselves Congolese. Yet they are not. Mm. 
because they are wiping out the Nandis. That mm. is why even the Kabaka of the Bakonjo in Kasese is suffering what he is suffering because mm. he's the Kabaka of all these people, regardless of the borderline. Anybody who knows mm. that region will say that. That I'm not mm. telling a lie about. So and while they are wiping out the Bakonjo of the other side of the border, who, who are now known as Banandi, they are terrorizing the Bakonjo of this side of the border, including their Kabaka, because now you are trying to wipe out the so-called ethnic group of Bakonjo, or Banandi for that mm -hmm. matter. So that is being done by the so-called new ADF. It's not the old ADF. Mm. And there are no monsters so, in this. Uh, so, Senior Chintu, uh, I would like for us to then talk about two things in this regard. Talk about uh, the first one is the old ADF. You know, just for a little bit of background for members of the audience, because I learned some new things from you of why the ADF was formed, what they wished to bring back once they overturned Museveni. And then on the other hand, I would like for us to talk about the attack on the Kabaka of Renzuri at, at that particular time and who that who actually was accredited for that attack. Because if if we go back to that point in time, Mohozi got all the credit and the backlash for for that attack and the arrest yes. of the of the Kabaka as well of that region. Um, I cannot tell you exactly when the old ADF was formed, but mm. it is many years ago, mm. many, many years ago. Um, when the old ADF was formed, yeah. it, was, it was out of a clear understanding of the situation that um, mm. the only way we have to get rid of Museveni's regime is through armed struggle. At that mm -hmm. moment, any Ugandan who was interested in his country believed that was the right thing to do. There are many other groups which were formed mm -hmm. to carry out the same uh, objective. You had the uh, Lakwena group, you had, um, I, I've forgotten all the other, forms of groups. You had even, um, there was one group which was formed by Bakonjo, uh, the man who was killed, uh, I've forgotten his name, but anyway, he was a Mukonjo man. I think he had been a minister in one of the governments. Mm -hmm. So that was a legitimate thing to do. The only, uh, the only problem one would probably say is that ADF was almost 100% Muslims, and they had their support from our side. I think we mentioned this in one of our uh, programs uh, several weeks ago, that they had funding from Saddam Hussein and mm. also from Dr. Turabi of, of Khartoum, who was their link to Muslim countries. When Saddam Hussein was killed, the supply of money and equipment was cut off automatically. And then later mm. on, Dr. Rabi of Sudan died of a natural cause. So they became an orphan group. However, they had already established themselves as a fighting force. But now their supply line is, is out. I can see the desperation that whoever lied to them, like Kagame lied to them, that if you sell me your name, I will assist you in overthrowing Museveni, they were able to, they were quick to bite the bet, unfortunately. But they should have known better. They, mm. they, they took, they accepted the deal, sold ADF as a name, in the same way as Kibarama sold Nope to Chagulanyi's group. But these guys sold the name to the wrong person. Mm. Even though 
he gave sanctuary to one or two people who were on top of ADF. And the other one went into Kampala, where he is comfortably living now. And the others remained outside the Uganda and, the, and the Rwanda. And they are there, they are totally silent. They are not going to say bloody word. Mm. So you can see this is a dirty business. The new ADF, which is now owned and controlled by Kagame and demanded by Tusis, no Muslims, no Ugandans, no Musoga, no Mukonjo, no nothing. But mm. purely Tusi. It is the one now using going into northern Kivu in Butembo and the Ituri area, slaughtering innocent people. Mm. And I can tell you, I overheard a conversation of one of the people who was sent in there. And he said, I feel uncomfortable because we are being sent in here to exterminate indigenous people. And with that order, he alerted one of the political leaders of that region of Congo that please do something so that your people may not suffer. But that political leader failed to do something. And these, troop, these troops of a new ADF moved in and started slaughtering innocent people. Mm. Those details I have already known because I have overheard the conversation. This, this is the problem we have. Many of our people are short-sighted and they can easily be fooled. The ADF should not have sold their name to Kagame on promise that he's going to assist them to overthrow M7. There is no way Kagame can conspire against M7. These are twins. They were together in the, jump, in the bush for five years. They plotted the whole plan of destroying Uganda, Rwanda, and finally Congo. And then they spread out one is ruling one part, the other one is ruling the other, and they are working in a concert. There is no way Kagame can undermine Museveni, nor is there any way Museveni can undermine Kagame. And those mm. idiots are running out there telling lies to each other that Kagame can help them overthrow Museveni, or telling lies that Museveni will overthrow Kagame. I say, you are a bloody fool. That is impossible. It is never, and it will never happen, a Mutusi to overthrow another Mutusi. Never. So, Senior Chincho, as we're on that note, I want us to then really back to why I don't think people understand why it's this is not a possibility that Kagame can actually go against Museveni or vice versa. Because we, if we can talk about one their shared interest and their undevoted support of each other, because even after all the propaganda that was played of them not being friends, they end up. That's why. Uh, I had kind of brought in Mohozi as well, because Mohozi plays this very important, but funnily enough, role in this whole public display of relationship, because we're publicly being displayed. They do a public display of their relations or relationship. At uh, first, there was a prolonged period where people believed that Kagame and Museveni were not friends, and people choose to actually forget that they fought the war together Kagame also served as the head of intelligence in Uganda before actually going to become the president of, of Rwanda. And Uganda broke a lot of international laws uh, by helping Rwanda march towards and to helping Kagame's force commit genocide all the way 
back on their way to Rwanda through the Congo, people seem to forget that they actually have, they are linked to each other. And people chose to believe that these two were not friends for a devoted period of time. But this is why then Muhozi comes sort of into the picture whereby we're seeing, because we also have to picture this as generation. This is generation of power control. They understand that after they're gone, there is a next generation that's going to have to take over power. And when I mean power, when I say power control, it's of the Great Lakes region, if we can assume that. Because right now they seem to have a hold of the Great Lakes region in two aspects. They have attained the political power for all, for themselves. They have attained the military power for themselves. And they have attained the economic power for themselves. They're the ones that, of course, the Western companies are funding to because they know they have the military power. So Muhozi then comes in. We must remember that Muhozi attacked Kasese with SFC. This was not a UPDF carried out event. This was special forces. This was SFC that was on the site and can give testimonies. But then after that period of time where people think Agam and Museveni are not friends, it is at Muhozi's birthday that they are now reclaim they have rekindled their friendship so why i give all this background is that i'd like to ask you mr chintu to please elaborate to people why is it that they will always be on the same page even when they are not on the same page publicly <clears throat> the politics behind that so that people can understand that this is there is political play here and it's not just people having personal problems with each other you mentioned about mohoz isn't it that mohoz is the one who sent this man who happens not to be a mutusi is it Ueru, Ueru, who did the massacre of the people in kasese I think that's yeah, the name. Muhoz. Yeah. Muhoz is the one who sent that that idiot to to massacre mm. the people, and he felt so proud of having carried out the order. And later on, he was mm. promoted. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's get that clear. Muhoz was the man, the one in the command, uh, but he used mm. this uh, indigenous Ugandan, who is a buffoon by all standards, to carry out the massacring of innocent Ugandans. Now you can understand, if we are going to make an attack on this tribe, let me use that terminology, this tribe mm -hmm. of Banandi on the side of Congo, we have to weaken it on this side of Uganda. Otherwise, Uganda, yeah. if, if, we, if we do not weaken it on both sides, we have a problem. And since their mm -hmm. Kabaka is on the side of Uganda, we mm -hmm. have to do something to bring him down, which they have done very successfully. Mm. Now, the, the attack on both sides is a very well calculated military attack to weaken the entire tribe of ba ba Banandi Bakonjo. And once you've taken over, we have already, I have already stated that the majority of this tribe lives in, in the Congo. It's a, a smaller portion that lives on the Uganda side. Now, the biggest portion of Banandi has been wiped out. They have lost millions of people, and those who have not been killed have run away <coughs> because of the terror they have uh, inflicted upon them. Now, the ones on the side of Uganda have also been weakened, especially when they cut out their head, their the kavaka. And many of them were slaughtered, as you, rem you remember, the massacre of Kasese. So as far as these Batus are concerned, that is a case complete. They have conquered these people. And they are now moving in with their uh, men and women, old and young, to settle in that corridor, claiming to to say they are the new settlers, they are, they are the new owners of this land. 
that's that's their plan and that's what they wanted to do and they have achieved it now you may also remember that the old adf had worked well hand in hand with the group of bakonjo who were led by i think the name was bazira isn't it someone could correct me if i'm wrong Bazira had organized the Bakonjo people to fight against the NRM dictatorship. ADF had worked hand in hand with this group, the old ADF. So you can see Bazira, by the way, was killed by the NRM regime. You can see that this group was very much feared by NRM. So they had to up attack them militarily and just cut them in pieces, which they have succeeded. For us who are looking at this situation, it gives us more proof that the only way we can bring about peace in our region, in our three countries, is to rise up and defend ourselves because they are now slaughtering one group after the other. They have already finished slaughtering their choris. Now they are slaughtering the, the Banandi Bakonjo, and they are now busy also slaughtering Baganda. Pretty soon, the only small tribes left in the country which will not be slaughtered as viciously as they are doing us, will be small tribes there like um, uh, Abasamia, Abagwere. <laughs> what can they do by themselves when the rest of the territory has been wiped out and conquered? Uh, look at the Banyankore. If you look at who claims to be a Munyankore, you even wonder. Some of us who grew up knowing who Banyankore looked like, we find a totally mm. different people. Yeah. And when I and see some Uganda purporting to say, oh, I have a Munyankore friend, I have married a Munyankore woman, and you look at them, what the bloody fool you are. Yeah. I want to quote one of your bloggers on these channels, that is Fred Lumbuye. He recently made a statement that a Mutusi will never betray another Mutusi, no matter what. And he even went a step further, warning those of you who have married them. He said, you go and do DNA for on your five children because chances are the four out of five are not yours. These people do not betray each other. No Mutusi is going to work against another Mutusi, period. Now, if you really believe that, you better go to Butabika and, and, and spend two weeks there under treatment because your head would need some repairs. These people are so deadly. And the only thing they know is to kill, to lie, to poison, to steal, and to break every law. Mm. I am going to go into this pro project a little bit more on a later time, but let me give you an example. Yeah. This new casino of Kigali, the one mm. some of our stupid friends in Boston invited to celebrate the Uganda Matters Day recently. Mm. He made a statement publicly that the God of Batusi is Paulo Kagame. And don't look for any other god. We already have one, Paul Kagame. Now, that was made by a stupid, idiot, devilish cardinal of the Catholic Church. Mm. Can you imagine that? And then you tell me that a Mutus could even be a religious person when a bishop mm. and later on became a cardinal could make that kind of diabolic statement that our God is a Paulo Kagame. And why in hell is a mm. Catholic bishop proclaiming to be a follower of Jesus Christ? 
These people don't even know who Jesus Christ, no matter whether he's a bishop, a priest, a cardinal, I don't care. They and, don't know Christ. And just, just before... Because hmm. it seems like... Because we can also, also look at the situation in Uganda whereby I think it is one of Museveni's daughters. You know, I've lost track of who's in education, who's in health, but one of them claims to be a pastor. If you're really a pastor, <laughs> You cannot then enjoy the wealth that your father is stealing, looting, and actually sitting on due to genocide. So I think we can all agree that when it comes to religion, religion has been used more so as an arm of propaganda other than what other people receive their religious beliefs to be. Because right now where we stand is we must always remember that for example, especially in Kagame's case, this is someone who was taken into Kansas in the US and trained by US intelligence forces in matters concerning, and this is well documented, concerning, of course, spreading of propaganda, making sure people believe you. And on top of that, this is someone who already has it embedded in where Ubuenge is part of the game, of the play, which also still translates to the same thing spreading lies and presenting them as truth to to not only fool the other but to make sure that the person you're telling the lies is forever destroyed and does not get to stand up but before we continue with all of this i would like to ask the producer to take us to a short break and after the break i want the producer to play one of the need uh the, one of the need tv videos the ones of the, uh that's the video of the of the lady from ankole talking about who actually is in that region because i think the more you say it some people might think that ah senior chintu is just out here making up lies and I want them to listen to a, a, a woman from Ankole region talking about who has actually taken over their region and who has the resources. Because if you're a Ugandan, you know, growing up, at least in my generation, we all had this an animosity towards the Bachiga and the Banyankole without actually knowing at the backdrop who really was behind the nepotism, that it wasn't them. It's even a few of them who, has, who have access to that so those sorts of positions so we'll take a short break and then we'll come back with that video right after we watch the this video as well i'm not satisfied with you handling my daily application why you are biased you aren't muslims and i'm a muslim you made a statement about two years ago that you are afraid that you may be killed by Muslims who get uh, who, who, who get access to call people outside reserve reason. Now, if you are afraid that I may call someone outside and kill you, how can you give me a bail to a to a partial freedom? And through his lawyers, make a formal application for my recusal from this year if he thinks that he has grounds. Asking them to cancel the bail for you not to hear it, you should be given another court official, not you. Twatika yoku sabaka foko kwa imiridwa, ulwe nsonga zea wamu koti katula yewe tu ze okusaba kuhulidwe. Necho mkisomu vio ludoli wabi, lugambi ya wafu na mpapula chikerezi, ngatela chitufu kwa wanga na fetu zenga tusavolu naku, tuate geze wako kwa sajonti, tukena kwa wanga tuja mkoti, ila tuze mkoti ni basa baba wawe naku, basa wale kuteka mwoku wa nukula. Kale, akutumide.
Why do we need the federal system of governance in Uganda? And what is federalism? Federal is a system of governance. It's not about getting rid of the central government. It's not about party politics. It's not about multi-partisan or absence of it. It's not about religious differences. It's not about tribalism. It is not for the benefit of Buganda alone. It's not about monarchism. It's not about land or dispossessing people from land. It is not about supremacy of one region over another or others. It's about helping the central government to provide services more efficiently and provide more effective development to the people. It's about sharing power and responsibilities between the central government and regional governments. Federalism is about providing more prosperity, more wealth, more feeling of belonging and participation in governance by marginalized and non-marginalized people. The federal system of government minimizes possibilities of waging war against the central government. It minimizes internal acts of terrorism and discontent against the central government. It has inbuilt safeguards that ensure uniform growth for all regions of the country and additional measures to make sure that the marginalized or less developed regions of the country can catch up through the system of equalization grants and affirmative action programs. This ensures that the regions with greater income and development contribute a pre-percentage of their earnings to the developed areas which may be less developed. It should be noted that federalism, though different from decentralization, does not contradict or exclude decentralization. The two systems can and should coexist and complement each other at the regional level. Advocating federal does not mean or seek to get rid of decentralization from regional tier nor does it mean getting rid of district MPs, LC leaders or other regional government officials. To learn more about federalism, register and join UFCC at www.ufcc.uk. Dr. Andrew Takome Kaira was born on 30th January 1945 in a small town known as Nkokonjeru in the Uganda region. He is regarded as one of Uganda's forgotten heroes, a true nationalist whose love for his country sent him to an early grave. He was a lawyer and professor and had many accomplishments since 1971, with many of his accolades attained from his education and political experiences both nationally and internationally. Significant is his doctoral dissertation titled Condoism in Uganda, which has awarded him an internationally recognized terminology now used in criminology. He joined several political organizations, including the Uganda Freedom Movement, UFM, which he was the leader, the Uganda National Liberation Front, UNLF, later joining the National Resistance Army, NRA, which had once been his organization's rival. Dr. Kaira is regarded as one of Uganda's forgotten heroes, a true nationalist whose love for his country led to his premature death. He was just 46 years old when he was assassinated on 6th March 1987 during a dinner with his close friends and three female acquaintances. His killers have never been brought to justice.
Welcome back from that short break and as always you're on the tower at UNN every Sunday we bring different issues different perspectives to discuss I'd like to tell members of the audience uh, now is a good time to start bringing in your questions any comments uh, the studio number is on the screen and Today I'm not in the studio by myself, I'm in the studio with Senior Chintu and we're discussing not only the beginnings but also the what led to the end and also how has the allied democratic forces also known as the ADF continued to be sounding in the news and who's really behind it and how did this transaction occur. Before the break we promised to show a video of uh, and the producer is going to play the video right after here because uh, Senior Chintu, you were making reference to clearing out of indigenous people and repopulating. It's kind of a repopulation uh, project that's been going on with the Chibwete regime in, Ra in Tanzania kicking out uh, members of the Tutsis, Tutsi ethnic group who were there, of course, due to what had happened earlier on in Rwanda when they were kicked out only to now come up in Congo and the clearing of area, so of, of the area now where the Bakonjo are in order to repopulate it with themselves and taking on the ADF. But I wanted us to play a reference video for how this happens. Because when you say to a day-to-day -day person, they will call it conspiracy. But I want us to listen to this video of a Muchiga lady and she's going to speak about what has happened in, in at least Ankole from that perspective, if we can take that point of view. So I'll ask the producer to please play this video and we'll watch this video first. Ngamba ankore, muri mwaba antuwebati. Tusi, haba ima, haba chiga, na haba nankore. Kata haba chiga na haba nankore. Baba itabiru. Atewa li. Bana baba antu. Katichetu sanga. Abana baba antu. Aba tu sinaba himu. Beba ino. Beba ino busobozi. Bulichi intichona. Bwetu genda mbiobu fuzi. Beba sarao. Anawa na kurembela. Echitu nduchunu. Atewa wetu genda mbiobu fuzi. Fa abairu. Tetubela na busobozi. Woku nonya aba kurembeze. Betuwa agara. Ate wabera ye mbundu ne senti. Bwebi gana no kuta wako lachi. Bata. Wetu genda. Mubiobu ramu. Tuina rifaru embarara. Ya western region. Na ye. Ebi zimbe ebi pia. Ebi limu. Bia private. They are owned private. Bia nanyini. Bia abuwa nanyini. Then tuina mu. Na maduka gama ragara. Agabu gana njini. Ngasika private. Ate tuinamu. Bine evi zimbe. Evi kade. Bieba zimba murujimu yoboti. Kate evi abana kwa viru. Mweba genda. Ate no sanga abarade. Ngabeba kawabweru. Bari ku oxygen. Bari ne kudrip. Ate ne. Nga. nga evi koze samu duariru. Bakuja ko sente, kato okuraba nga city scan. Bakuja ke mituara asatu, asatu muetano. Gurichimu mduwari lotu kwa rachi, tuchisasuru. Atenga liya government, atemu masomero. Osange somero, esomero limu, lina habana nga rusamu. Nga ba ina haba somesa, nga kumi oba musamu. Muprivate, atenga teba ina na classrooms a walk tour. Atena echi la ramu education. Wabela yo uh, shikarashi pseziva musteti. Na yezi genda mufamili zezi muzi nezaba tu, eza tusi neba ima. Ate ekonomikari mubye mfuna. Beba ina ebye mfuna ebye amanyi. Beba ina zi factorizi. Ate tebasa sura misoro. Tebasa sura biru zama sanyaraze. Tebasa sura biru za mazi. Ate oruvanyim. Ezo zona biru. Vazi teka kubana abairu. Abaina. Obu business obutono. 
Atene echila la mwankore region. Bano, aba, a, the Tusi and Bayima. Beba ino kusara o. Mwana wani agenda, mufam, agenda kumulimuguno. Mwana wani ana agenda mumaje. Ana agenda mupolis. Nobu otu ukayo. Echo chuku gobelela. Neba gambo no mwana wagundu. Tumwe chifochino. Katife tusigaranga. Tusi Abairu. Tukorela the Tusi and the Bayimu. Atebwe tuvayo. Egwanga rituraba chimu. Na yebo the Tusi and Bayimu. Bekwe se wansi. Wabairu. Okurimbe egwanga mbufena tulichi. Tulichimu. Faina. Abairu beba kozesa. Ngeno nga bwechiri. The ministers, the what? Ngawa wa Uganda region, other regions. Ne wafwe wechiri, wechiri, wechiri. Na fwewa jayo, ne wafu jayo, ne wafu kozesa. Na yenga toi nachi, toi na buyinzi. Shechi la rachimu waga na tuyekimu Uganda. Thank you very much. Kati habayi ruwa jakubira all over the country. Not just by nyankore and by chiki. Eh, if these people have their plan, they want to make a source of Iru. For me, I'm not a Muiru. Hmm? And I will never be anybody's Muiru. As we can see, none of this, this is being documented in real time, and we are choosing to ignore what's actually happening. Because many people, not even many people, because I don't speak to many people, but the sentiment is that we haven't gotten a hold of the political reality that's happening, that they are a feudalistic group that feel entitled to the whole Great Lakes region. Well, you are right. Remember that Munyarwanda Gashumba told you that we are the ones who decide who is going to be a leader. And he was not kidding. But the mm. most unfortunate part of it mm. is that hundreds and hundreds of our people, no matter how yeah. these words uh, these words are resonated and resounded yes. and reread and respoken, they just can't learn. What's wrong with our people? Are they stupid? Mm. Are they deaf? Have they been bewitched? That I don't understand. Mm. All these messages have come to them and they still don't pick up. We have spoken we have so seen. much about this, uh, the evil tragedy of our region. And I will go in the details a little bit more later on. But let me tell you one thing. In Rwanda, when RPF took over, mm. they had nine Catholic, you know, Rwanda is a predominantly Catholic country. They had mm. nine bishops. Five of them were Hutus, and four were Tutsis. Unfortunately, out of those five, four happened to be at a place called um, um it's near Gikongoro. they rounded them up yes. paraded them naked and they slaughtered all the Hutu bishops plus 12 priests and there were some truces, including nuns. None of those were touched. Those were spared. Only the Hutus were killed. The one bishop who had not been present inside Rwanda happened to have been away in Congo. When he came back later, they killed him. But I will go into details about his killing at a later time. Mm. At this moment, out of those nine bishops in, Kigal, in Rwanda, eight of them are Tusis, only one is a Mutu. 
and out of those eight bishops, including the cardinal, have wives and children. Hmm. So you can see these people, they have no religion. The only religion they have is Bhutusism. Hmm. And their practice is killing, telling lies, and doing anything devilish. You, that woman talked about education. Mm. Right here in Silver Spring, Maryland, where I live, I met a colonel who came in from Rwanda. He was hanging around with some people I know who are Black Americans. And I questioned mm. him about the situation in Rwanda. He said, a Hutu child can only go up to the eighth grade is not allowed to go to the ninth grade. And the only children who can go beyond the eighth grade have to be two Cs. And of course, that includes universities and professional training. Now you're talking about discrimination. Mm. A Hutu family, whoever is left in Rwanda, can only be a laborer at a two C family. He cannot even own his own Kaduka selling mandazi in his neighborhood. No. Because all that has to belong to Mutusi. 100% of all the military officers in, our, in the Rwanda Defense Force are Batusi. Not a single Hutu in there. I mean, you talk about discrimination. You can see each in every camp, in every sector of the society. They are not allowing anybody else who is not one of them. Especially and because they are such an excellent, ex, yeah, yes, and because they are such excellent liars. With a smooth tongue, I think they go and they buy some gas or some diesel and this, you know, smoothen their tongue. Like we've had on this program, that character who comes, in, well, we are all human beings. We were all born in the same way. We should live together and reconcile. Bologna, why doesn't he go and reconcile with his own people? This is the culture they have developed for over 400 years and they are still practicing it. Yeah. It reminds me of the late Christopher Mutikira of Tanzania, mm. who explained the problem of his country with regards to the Batusi. And he said, if the devil belongs to a tribe, it's a Tusi. Now, you mentioned why Equator kicked out these people from Tanzania. Mm. Equator complained about the injustices mm. in Rwanda. Mm. And Mus Kagame made a public statement that if Kikwete is talking like that, we are going to meet at some place and he will know who I am. Mm. When Kikwete got that message, he looked in his own country and found out that there were so many imposters who claimed to be Tanzanians when they are actually Tusis. The general in the army who, is in, who was in charge of training and recruitment was posing as a man from Kegoma area, Kumbe, he was a Tusi. The education attache in their embassy in Washington, D.C., claimed to be a Tanzanian from Bukoba yet she was a Tusi. The ambassador of Tanzania in Nigeria claimed to be a Tanzanian, yet he was actually a Tusi. They were all hiding in a local environment, disguising themselves as Tanzanians when they were not. And then they found out that they were planning to train and groom 
a bunch of military officers within the Tanzanian forces for eventual overthrow of the government and they take over that country. Yeah. That's, those are the things that pissed off Chikwete and they kicked the hell out of them, all of them, out of the country. They are the ones who went, when they left Tanzania, they went through Uganda, ended up in Rwanda, and Kagame put them in a training camp in Mutara, which is located in the Kagera National Park, who are now the new ADF after they bought the name. So you can see what this woman is talking about in Ankole. Yeah. How many of you have been told, oh, Mrs. Is, I'm not going to mention the name, Mrs. Is so and so is from Uganda, is the Munyankore? Bullshit. Mm. Mrs. Is so and so. And look at them. All the people who have been enticed into the legs of these Batusi women are the ones who are selling us. Mm. We have said this over and over, and I'm repeating it. I hope I can repeat it the last time that people will learn. Mm. You Ugandans, indigenous Ugandans, who have married these women, you are the first line of danger to our country. Because from what we know about them, they have used their daughters to manipulate us to the point mm -hmm. of taking over the country. It is through these women, plus other tactics of buying you by giving them millions, I know of one religious leader who was mm. given millions, not once, not twice. The last consignment he swallowed from Museveni was 285 million, and he's not alive today. I know another leader, a religious leader, who took 200 million from Museveni at night. And Museveni's boys escorted him back to his house or his home diocese. <laughs> He's not alive today. So we have a lot of information to give to our people, but they are not listening. They are blinded by yeah. greed, greed, and the sexual desires from these women. As if they are the only woman, women who can give you sex. It's terrible. Mm. Personally, what I have seen, what I have known, what I can speak about and what I cannot even speak about is too much that it is really suffocating my, my thoughts. Mm. And it makes me sick when I hear those idiots calling in, please, let me advise you right from now. If you are one of them, don't bother calling because I don't want to talk to idiots. I don't talk to witches. I don't talk to killers. I don't talk to experts in poisoning people. I don't talk to pharaohs who are out there to kill other people whether in Congo, Uganda, or wherever. Mm. So as we as we continue, we've gotten a few voice notes, Senior Chintu, and I think it's becoming clear as day of what's happening. I want people to pay extra attention to this is not just people this is not just an ethnic group that has been talked about just because of behaviors, this and that. We have to come to the realization that they are heavily militarized and can overthrow governments. They are threats to so many governments. The Ugandan government has was overthrown and the country was we don't even have a nation as of now. 
as we speak. It's been overtaken. It's been a threat to Tanzania. It has been a th in Burundi. I think they're facing similar things. And in the Congo, it continues. So we'll listen to some of the voice notes that we have received, and then we'll take it from there. So the first one, Mr. Jindu, it's from Mr. Lubwama in Kampala. I'll go ahead and play it. Um, good evening, Desire. Thank you for the program. We really appreciate uh, Thank you, Mr. Remigius Jindu. We are really pleased for the information you are giving us. Uh, my question goes to you, Mr. Kinto. How can really those uh, small community, the Tusis, analyze multiple tribes in Uganda, a large community? Actually, I would say it's the largest community we Ugandans. How can the small community control us like that? There has to be something. Because when you try to see northern, northern area only, those northern people, they can mobilize and then they control their area whereby no one can go through or go out of it. Of it. But why is it that is still the two seas are controlling that area? What's the problem? Are there some people from northern people who are working for these people, controlling their fellows on behalf of the Tusis? Because I don't think the Tusis alone can control those people in that area. It is impossible. Because those people, they can uh, connive and then work on them properly. But what is the problem? Who are those people in northern Uganda who are betraying their fellows? That's my question. Thank you. And I'll go ahead and then also play another message. And this is from uh, Brother Malik from London. I'll play that next. Our desire, thanks for hosting the show and bringing our elder and senior Remedius Chintu in UNN studios. And also thanks for analyzing the conflict in the DRC with these proxy rebels, you know, the ADF that was, uh, you know, created by Kagame and Museveni to wage war, uh, you know, against the Congolese people and the Hutus. But my question goes to our senior Remedius Chintu, do you think that the former Tanzanian president, Jakar Kikweta, do you think he would ever step into this conflict? Because he knows where all of this, where all of these problems started, because he kicked out those Rwandan refugees from Tanzania and they were displaced. And now they are creating chaos in the eastern region do you think he would ever come out and address this conflict that's going on you take care bye uh, hmm. So you want me to answer those questions? Yes, and then we'll move let, on to the next question. Let, let me start with the easiest question uh, by mm. Brother mm. Malik. Kikwete did the right thing because as a president of Tanzania, his primary responsibility was to protect his country. And after he accomplished that, whether these people have now gone into another country or whether in a neighboring or distant country, that's none of his responsibility. He did the right thing. If we people in Uganda could do the same thing and protect our territory, we would be doing the right thing. Every country has a duty to defend their territorial integrity and to protect, to protect the 
or rather to create peace and tranquility in their territory. That's what Kikwete did, and he did a good job. So whatever has befallen the neighboring countries, too bad, but that can be another topic. The job was well done. Now, the first question was about how come these people are so um, successful in uh, terrorizing the northern region and uh, i think it was a lady if i'm not mistaken terrorizing the northern region when we all know that the northern region people particularly the Achoris, can really unite and uh, defend themselves yes it is a puzzling uh, situation one thing you have to understand that the two seas are organized and very focused and among them among them although they come from two different camps one of them are what you call the banyiginya which is a group which migrated from sudan and the the other one is called abega which migrated from eritrea and those are the ones who are notorious for poisoning and all the evil things but i will talk about that another time they are all focused on one mission to take over wherever they can so that they can have a territory they control and own now why this person is concentrating on the northerners i would say look at you the baganda you claim to be so powerful, which is not wrong, it is true. But how come they have just walked over you and taken over? We know several reasons why. One of them is that they have used their women to lock you up in their legs. And the you men who are locked up in those Batus women's legs, you are finished. You can't be a Muganda man anymore. Two, they have used money, state money, to bribe you and corrupt you. And this corruption has spread all over Uganda. If you had, and I hope one day you can replay those old videos, if you had that man who was a so-called speaker, whom they poisoned and died in Seattle, Washington, UK, as their prime minister said. The man, I don't even know what kind of brains he had. The way he was praising himself so that he, be, he can become a speaker of the, the parliament and rich, literally betrayed his own people. And that's corruption in full gear. If you come to the Baganda, besides women, corruption of money, and then you have the Kakamega group, which Mr. Kimbugwe expounded not too long ago, very thoroughly. You become yeah. such a weakened people. You do not have unity as Baganda when you have Kakamega in your blood. How many of our brothers and sisters who have sold us because they believe in that mentality of Kakamega? That person is a Catholic. We are not going to do this because he might succeed. That person is a Muslim. We cannot support him because he's a Muslim. You are trying to bring back Idi Amin. That person is this. That is what has killed Buganda. From the day one it was created. Before we had this problem, we could work as Ugandans. And those of us who have tried to unite us, let us work as Baganda, as Ugandans. You, you listening to me, a good man of you, and I, I know some of you by name, have been undermining our activities for your stupid agendas, deeply founded in Kakamega mentality. Those are the problems. And these Batusi have found it as a fertile ground to sow their seed 
and they progress. I remember very well when we were working on Idi Amin's issues as Ugandans, there was a Mutusi guy there called Kamunanuire. He was always in our midst, very silent. But when we succeeded against Idi Amin, they are the ones who were working with their fellow Tusis because they knew what we were doing, who was doing what, who was contributing what, mm. who was succeeding and who was not succeeding. And I recall I was in Nairobi to be specific at Jamuhuri Estate of Ngongo Road. And that Mutusi woman who was married to Sam Sebagereka told me that this war you people have waged is going to take five years. I looked at her, I said, wait a minute, it can't take five years. It's going to be done within a few months. After all, the Obote regime was weak. She said, no, you wait. And she introduced me to a song which they had already coined. Neyagari Ramu Seveni, Ananjagara Nangoverera, Baganda Bange, Tweyagari Ramu Seveni. And I said, where in hell did you get that song? And she was laughing because she was a jolly woman. I didn't know that these people were conspirators of the highest degree. And look how many years did it take? Five years. Yes. By the time it was over, Museven was on top. And that Mutusi guy who was in New York, Kamunanure, we, don't, we didn't even know where in the world it came. We had, he was ambassador to the UN, ambassador to Germany, ambassador to what? Because they knew our weaknesses. This is what we have to stop. We must focus, we must be as focused as it requires to be Ugandans, to be Baganda, to be Batoro, to be Banyoro, Basoga, in all our different states and work for the survival of our country called Uganda. Otherwise, we are finished. Mm. We are finished. And by the way, we are not only finished politically, we are going to be dead because these people cannot stand seeing us breathing and kicking. And then we'll move on to the next voice message. And this one is from Raymond in Germany. Good evening, viewers and uh, our panelists. The Honorable Remedius Chind and Desire. My name is Raymond. I would like to thank you very much for the program. And then, of recent, I saw that there was a delegation that was sent to Uganda to meet Mr. Museven, and it was sent by President Kisekedi. I just don't really know because he he tried to seek advice from Mr. Museveni how Congo can deal with the M23 question. <laughs> now, I don't really, because I'm trying in, in my mental capacity to understand what Mr. Kisegedi thinks about. This is on the backdrop of the previous uh, agenda or agreement they signed in Nairobi, where East African forces were called in to try and uh, uh, fill in that gap of uh, over dysfunctional Congolese army. Now he goes ahead. He say he sends a delegation to meet Mr. Museveni. So I am wondering. He seems to be so confused because actually also a week earlier on he had met Mr. Kagame in 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 uh, Angola, and then Kagame signed a, a, a ceasefire on behalf of M23 that he says he does not support. How can you sign a ceasefire on a rebel force that you say you don't support? <laughs> so, it seems that Mr. Kisekedi is blind about, or his intelligence is totally wrong, or he tries not to believe that since he met someone the other day, he tries not to believe that that person probably is stabbing them at their back. I just don't understand how someone at the back of your mind, you can try to send a delegation to Uganda country where the attacking forces actually passed through. I 
through yeah. the past through the, the Bunakana board and the adult call. So I am just trying to put myself in the shoes of Mr. Kisekedi. It's it's unfair that I don't really know what's happening in Congo. Probably the people must also be so much trying to get him out of office. I'm not so sure about all of that, but anyone of sober mind will just try to want to ask themselves, what's this guy about? Because you can't be sending a delegation to someone who you are very sure and have all the evidence that he's the one who is feeding the other guys. Maybe you could, Mr. Majeski, you would try to enlighten me. Maybe he's trying to play some card here. Very, very simple, Raymond. One is, I want to advise you, please don't you try to put yourself in Kisekedi's shoes. You might come out with the gangrias and any other foot diseases. When I was growing up, my grandmother used to give us a few shillings to go down the road and capture fishmongers. He always, my grandmother used to tell us, don't buy those fish which look so big. They don't taste good. Buy medium-sized fish. But I didn't understand it until I have grown up that the huge, oversized, huge tilapias do not have the same taste as the medium-sized tilapias. So, when I look at Kisekedi, he reminds me of my grandmother's advice. I have spoken to many Congolese from different areas of their political spectrum and their conversation, their conversations regarding Kisekedi is much more harsh than your discussion today. Nevertheless, the Congolese people will take care of that. I know they will, because there is no way they can survive as Congo DRC with an inept leadership of Kisekedi. There is no way. But I feel sorry for him as a person because if he continues that line of activity, he may not be around to enjoy Christmas with his family. It's very unfortunate. That is how far you can go talking about that topic. But thank you very much for the question. And this one, uh, Senior Chint, is from Godfrey in Uganda. Good evening, UNN. Good evening, Mr. Shintu and Desire. Uh, I have, I was just like uh, proposing if there could be a way out whereby we could put a budget, we put a budget beside, then all like in form of fundraising, fundraising, then the little we can have, we put it there. Slowly, slowly we put it there. Then at least I think it will give people morale. If you, you say we have a budget of this, even if we, we don't mention it publicly, but uh, the the way it is going to be used, we put that budget there, then at least we can work while knowing the how the target is going, yeah, how much the target is. I think uh, we can't fail, though slowly, slowly, I think uh, we can get that money. Though we are not earning much, but someone can know that at least it can give people morale. If this one comes, I'm giving maybe one and the other one comes, I'm giving 500. In the long run, you find that money 
he has accumulated and we can start from there because i don't think we might need all that much but something that can start others will follow because if you have to wait for everyone i don't think everyone some will just wake up and follow and then i'm going to go ahead and also play another message from uh brother malik let me end with this uh, statement and i just want to let our listeners be aware that i've never changed my words and i don't mince and i made it very clear even to mulangira he himself and i said if i ever find out that the people who are running this platform at tutsis i will not be associating myself on this platform and I've never changed my words since then and I've never changed my position because I have principles. And this goes back to prove what our elder is talking about. And I was one of the first people to come on this platform to teach our fellow listeners about Tutsis and how they use a cultural trait called wenge to lie, manipulate, to con, to use treachery, to kill, to use all kinds of evil, evil against the people in Rwanda and a whole humanity. And everything that I came and said about those people is backed with solid concrete evidence historically and present and this is what our elder is saying we are not hating those people because of their facial features we're not hating no no we hate those people because of their ways because of their indoctrination because of why they were being kicked out in Tanzania and why they don't want them in Congo and why we don't want them in Uganda. That's the reason why we don't want them. And then last but not least, I will go ahead, Senior, and play uh, voice notes from Bashir in South Africa. Hello, good afternoon. Good evening, good morning, UNN. Madam Siza, come on now. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. From Uganda, I'm with Bashir, one of South Africa. Weber and Yoba Nango, two Ereza, desire Weber or Kuberao. Kueva, you could demon in on the Nevaza Mukado affair, a media stream too. Weber or Kuso Messa. Nabo, Nabo, na. Avali ku UN yeni timu yone kore dimu lino vana umu nimu kwe muli komu nene nyo ate tusima Mweba le nyo kwe wae uwa kade wa fewa profesa kuchina Mwurangira juko Mazinga Mweba profesa bonava lala mweba le nyo Mweba le dada neba zana mwe mwenaba following a UN yeni mkoro umu nimu kuno kurawe katugusa fedro Noku vusaba na Uganda mweba le nyo mweba le dada Mugamania, but sharing a boom message, WhatsApp, Puko, Facebook, when I'm ever and they missed a media sina chibuzo. Could you call Kubeva, the Mueva or two way, Ram Banachi, Mugueva, a Weva or Kukurembera revolution, you know? Two way, a call, Raku or Russo would the Botuquata program, Metuzi, Woodizang, as he say, call, well, would they? Nanga will knock two way, a cotula, but two woodies. E ya doruso hude utu kwa ata Metule mungo kubawa kwa live Na yebu lichimutu chiforo wenge Ratu higa tuliva hizi E ya nzanyo mwebali nyo mwebali hita Kozi enso nge ndala Mkada wa fe Mr. Medias E dimu ni nore tulikweli oku laga wa na Uganda Anti ya batu usiwe varabe batu Tu ino ditu wa lida dala masos Se fena nga bali ku UNN kuba bali wechizubuchenda ba oraba obera katinga abantu abali ewakeyo 
bali mu NUP ne bwobaga abanne NUP hejude batusi siba fe sibe ba mukufe tebategera kintu kigera masoza ne obatu nanga bala okukati nga olaba rubongo ya katana bana ba musebenere de ya koze bulichimu oli na bayo na kuga rubongo ya wafe okuva di okuvadi abantu tebanna kitegera nti abanya Rwanda abatusi tebaina nkola ngaza fe kabira ndala na dalaya abaga nti omuganda aso okuchawa ne muganda naba ngata sala mudiro mudiro lyo ba mu rujalo neba libo te bachikola tebeva am nebo batunule eno mawanga je tuli babera chimu baba chitole tebeye kera katete chinu chisha ale mena dankte abaganda bafabali ye wako chitegera kyo mtu ustaenza kuva mtu si munne balira wam baba tuli na mulinga nkuyegezora era tu ine dimu dene buli omu okurera anti ategeza family ye omikwano je obutesembereza bantu abo newe baba de mu meeting to ina kuberawo kuba baba bazenga ba mbega nga begonza befura abali ekimuna yanzanyo actually we'll answer to those senior change and then we'll continue um, yes, thank you very much, Bashir. I have nothing to add on. For. You have said it all, and maybe you have even said it better than I do. Mm. And we have pounded this issue over and over and over. But our people, I don't know whether they were bewitched. But anyway, we are not going to stop pounding this information to them until we crack their heads with sense. That's all I can say. The other person who talked about having a budget, mm. in every activity, people have a budget. Mm. But the budget for what? Mm. I remember, I think I said this at one of our programs, that when I was a student here, we all did labor jobs. That's how I supported myself through, through the universities. I didn't come up, I didn't come to America with a scholarship. But I remember my friends who were from Ethiopia at that time, mm -hmm. they were fighting a war of liberating themselves to declare Eritrea. Mm. And they had an office in Washington, D.C. on Columbia Road and 18th Northwest, not too far from where the Ghanaian emb embassy is. They used to go there and they deposit five to ten dollars every Friday. There are times I remember some of them were saying, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, I have to leave before they close the office. I said, where are you going? I'm going to our office to pay my weekly due. That mm. is the money they raised to fight the Eritrea war. And they succeeded. With that money, they were able to buy materials. And back home, I was told, they had some of their own countrymen who had degrees in chemistry, in physics, in mathematics, in all the sciences. And they were making homemade explosives. They used to tell us about it, but I was so naive and young at that time. This is 100 years mm -hmm. ago, by the way. And I didn't understand what these guys were doing. They were saying, oh, no, yeah. because we can't weapons from outside we have to improvise and make explosives and we have mm. some of our people who are good in chemistry in this in that in that and they are they are doing them back home there in, in Ibisakate. and finally they fought the war and now you have Eritrea okay look at yeah. the, your Uganda today let's not go go very far how many Ugandans are telling you we are in a struggle to remove a dictator. Mm -hmm. They were just recently in Amsterdam, Holland, paying about 250 euros to enter 
the hall. And yet, they had no more than 80 people. That's what I was told. I wasn't there. They said, anyway, the number in the hall was between 50 and 80 Ugandans showed up, paying this kind of money, just to have a good time seeing and a dance and a drink and probably even get a few phone numbers of beautiful girls paying that mm. kind of money for fun. Now they are going to be in the Hilton Hotel in California. I have nothing against getting it together. But when I know what United States looks like, that Hilton Hotel has the facility whereby President Obama could hold a big campaign function. And if the Democratic Party or even the Republican Party rented it for a day or so for their pro political functions, you are talking about money. We are not talking about $500 or $1,000. Hell no. Not with a Hilton. And who are in charge of this? Nyarwandas who lead new offices in Boston, in Toronto, and everywhere. And you see, and this, what mm -hmm. is this money going to do? If these people could follow what this person who called in from Kampala saying, let's have a budget. First of all, you should, if they are, if they are serious, if they are serious about removing a dictator, and instead of paying the 200, I think they said 200 or 280 dollars, well, the Los Angeles thing, I think it's about 200 or 280 dollars per person, plus boat cruise, plus this, plus that. Do you remove a dictator by sailing on a goddamn boat cruise? Whom are you fooling? Money making machine. This the intelligence, the common sense, which even a frog has, they could do better than that. Mm -hmm. Just follow what this woman has said. Put just a hundred dollars, or if you can't afford a hundred dollars, put ten dollars contribution. Set up a goddamn budget and they say we are going to remove a dictator. Here is my contribution. When the money is big enough, to buy an explosive, let's go blow the goddamn shit out of them. Mm. Because that's what we have to do. And we should not bite our tongue about it. These bastards have, be, have to be blown out. And yet you are, mm. you are going to spend this kind of money dancing around all night long, sailing on a boat cruise, getting drunk, and screwing any kind of woman you can find in Los Angeles. This yeah. is nonsense. You people participating into this, contributing to this kind of foolishness, you are working from seven. Because you are uh, suffocating those who would want to see Museven go. And there are many, many people who are now believing that you really have an agenda when you have nothing but manure. You have no agenda for removing a dictator. Mm. Put, put $10 each. But anybody who is going to contribute to this kind of funding, I think you should find a mental hospital somewhere where you live. But Senior Chit, what's so not funny but ironic about people who are, firstly, it's if you're working out here, not only for your survival in the diaspora, but for the survival of your people home, it was inconsiderate to ask people who you want to actually come to a function for change, to ask them for 250 euros. That's a lot of money. It can pay a lot of bills, from your phone bill to electricity bill to water to just home maintenance. That's a lot of money for a household to lose while abroad, especially if you're an immigrant. Let's start there.
Number two is them doing it without purpose. As a nation, we need to really wake up to even not tolerate such masquerading. Like a party that is claiming to lead us to liberation cannot wake up and ask us to pay 250 and we let that go over our heads lightly. We should be full of anger. Because 250 for you to come talk in our hall. 200, you're asking for 250 and you haven't even given us a budget of where this money is going. 250 and we don't know what's the, pop, the purpose of this congregation. 250, where is this 250 going to go in the revolu revolution itself? And where is the organ? We should dust off the confusion, Ugandans, dust off the confusion. It's when we're confused that we're fooled. And we are confused people. Accept that you're confused and look for some sense. Once we get past that point, we can then actually start to see ourselves manufacture a future for ourselves. But if we're acting like we're not confused, and then we start jumping onto confused people's agendas, we will be in the same cyclical cycle as always. But I'll go ahead and play some of our last voice notes. And this is from Zab Zabi. I, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, from UAE. Desire and Mr. Chintu, thanks for the program. I came on the program a bit late, but I would want to ask Mr. Chintu, don't you think this, this Grace Evingra was behind the murdering of people in northern Uganda, that Kony War? Because I remember you telling us that Evingra told you that when they get into power, they will kill those who solo, meaning those northern Uganda people in the north. So don't you think he was behind the, the murdering of most of the people there? Because you told us he was the um, he was a special advisor to Museven when Museven got into power. So I would want to ask you if you think he was behind most of the things Museven was doing. And another thing you told us, Ibingira said, if you want to control a country, you control the army, the intelligence, information and finance and m7 has done that very well that means if Ingira was behind the teaching of m7 those things because he's the one who told you that and he was behind m7 when he came to power he was a special advisor to m7 that means most of the things which are disturbing uganda rotated about rotated around the Ingira. Ingira was a very big head in these two seas to occupy us, even in diaspora, because he was there, he knew your people, he was talking to you, so he knew how to plant people on you who are two seas. And then for our next voice note, this is from Andrew in Uganda. <coughs> Everybody could two ways. Who was the way to Nam Uganda? I want to have a more buying a battle of a beer a kingdom maso. Babu can be babes. I was a era. We have a lot, we have a lot to enlighten these people. I want those of now for Savanta about to infiltrate in Nam Uganda. Now, for see where we go, why I am, but I want and it is worse in central Uganda. Of now, for see wounds, either the time you are going revolutionary tools or saying a jack we know could have war. Otherwise, in a vingy we are called get a hands and babies around your two ways. What we get I appreciate. Um, Kadu of Remedias Chinto, and I appreciate you for your wisdom. Ira, Kwagamu, Uganda, and Pia, Ojivirim. Thank you. Bye bye. Um, yeah. First, uh, the gentleman who quoted me about my comments with regards to Grace Vingira. You are absolutely correct. You quoted me right, and I stand by those words. 
One thing I can add on is I definitely Ibinjira was a prominent member of the hiding Batusi because many people, including those he was with in the UPC, really honestly believed he was a Munyankole Muhima. Because I've spoken to some prominent members of UPC. A good man of them are my friends, although I am I have never been a member of UPC. And they told mm -hmm. me they were shocked when I revealed to them that, do you know that Ibinjira was not buried in Uganda when he died? And they said, mm -hmm. yeah, we heard about that. The man was buried in Rwanda because he willed to be buried at his ancestral place. Mm -hmm. Yet many people believed he was a Mnyankole and he almost became president of UPC by the way. Now, with regard to those statements of saying we have to wipe out those Busoro, meaning neurotic people, I do not believe this was his idea in isolation. I think he was echoing what they were already planning and programming. Because those people work in in secrecy. None of them will say something which is not from the rest of the group. And by loose tongue, he, he mentioned that to me because I believe he underestimated my intelligence at the time. Mm. Later on, when he became advisor to Museveni, that was already that was already in their plan because i don't think Ibinjira actually wanted to be a minister he had been a minister before he had been ambassador before he didn't want any position but he wanted to be a, a, a senior citizen retired but guiding the ship in whichever way he can and he did it he did it I am suspicious who was also responsible for recruiting young Tusis into Museveni's camp. By that I mean he knew who their people were, who was in California, who was in Germany, who was in England, and they brought them in no time and beefed up the whole team. That's what senior advisors like Ibinjira could do. Um, uh, Andrew has made a comment that Baganda are Banafusi. Yes, a good men of Baganda are very much of Banafusi, which, I mean, you just, you just can't trust them. Let me give you an example. You have a man called Robert Sebunya. You will sit down with him thinking you are talking to a fellow Muganda. Before you know it, he's telling Jim Mwes what you've been discussing. <laughs> Honestly, I know that as a fact. When Jim Mwes was head of what was it called by then, ESO or ESO, one of them, this was the man informing him of everything that some of the Baganda were doing and planning. You have uh, who betrayed the Baganda on Bugerere rioting? It was not an Achori or a Musoga. It was a Muganda in the military. So you can, you can find a lot of Baganda who have sold their fellow Baganda because either Museven is going to give him money, which he has done, Mm. Or he has a Mutusi woman in his bedroom. Or he is aspiring for something which have, they have promised him and haven't delivered. In the end, they may not even deliver it. Mm. And then there are others who are just plain blood and income pumps who think that by reporting these kind of things, 
it will make him to feel to be important in society. Yeah. Again, I have an answer to that. When we have purport visitors, those are the first people who have to be dealt with and we have no apologies to make because we need purport to wipe out this kind of bullshit among Bagandas who are set out and clean the country once for all so that anybody left and surviving will know as the Americans would say, don't you ever F around with us because we are here to defend our country and save it from the Tusi occupiers. Those who know American English would pick it up real quick. And we're going to listen then to another one. This is from Matthews in the US. Right. Thank you so much for the program, our senior media chain. Uh, thank you so much for the program as well. I have a simple question. Um, is Dr. BCJ was a student of being here? Uh, being here, the one who said that uh, to, uh, going to kill the Achor is like what? Is the, Dr. BCJ is a student of being here as well was the one who designed the IRC system who, who organized and who had that strategy of IRC that Museven is following and to keep him in power. His messenger was a student of being here as well. And then also, uh, also we have uh, a message that they actually paid there was difference in prices 250 was for the general public 500 euros were for a vip table but <laughs> it was vip <laughs> there was vip when people when all we have seen and the things that actually brought our hearts and souls into this revolution was of course the togetherness but it was to avenge not only avenge but bring justice to people who died and people out there paying 500 euros for a vip table but now you're gonna with them anyway and in amsterdam the the vip table was 500 euros after the show they went for vacation in italy to go shopping hey you will pretend to want to live the life of the european but it's expensive Anyway, Senior Chintu, what would you say about these messages? Well, what let me for? tell you something. You've talked about going to Italy for shopping. I have been Clots all over for... Italy. Mm. I have been all over Italy. One time I was in Milano and I wanted mm. to buy a tie. This is, uh, I think, 15 years ago, 15 mm. or 20 years ago. I wanted to buy a tie so that I can say, hey, this tie I'm wearing is from Milano. And I looked at the ties. I asked the woman how much, the, well, this was before they had the euros, they had the liras by then. She told me the price in liras. And I said, how much is that in US dollars? Because I had dollars. Uh, she calculated, that will be $60. I said, you want me to buy a tie? for $60? She said, well, you have to understand you are in Milano. This is the capital of Italian silk industry. I said, thank you very much, ma'am. I can't afford to buy it. I walked away. Then one, another time I was in Rome and I was with my auntie's daughter who lives there. And she had a friend who had a duca. He designed the suits. And he told me he makes suits for very wealthy people who come in. Most, she, he said most of his customers are from America. I said, oh, how much are your suits? And he told me $6,000 a suit. And he told me of one American who, who is one of his customers, 
generally when he comes in, he says, okay, I want this, that, that, and usually orders about 10 or, excuse me, or 12 suits, each one costing about $6,000 equivalent. Now, if you are talking about shopping, please don't mess around with Italy. At least go to Greece. In Italy, you are going to spend money. And you go, if you go to Rome, there is an area called the leather industry. When you walk in there, you can smell leather because they bring cow hides or sheep or goat hides, clean them, process them to the point of making shoes, handbags, leather jackets, anything to do with leather. I walked in there about seven, eight years ago. And I saw handbag for a lady. Now, if you went with your Benz Sports, you better watch out. I saw <laughs> handbags ranging from 4,000 euros and above. And I am suspicious. I don't have to tell you who, but if you went with your Benz Sports and they said, I want that lady leather handbag and they say six thousand dollars since you got it cheap you're going to give it away and she might even want it two or three of them one in red one in blue one in whatever so Italy is not a cheap country to go to when you're talking about shopping but look at this Every single bloody day in Uganda, there is a noob guy picked up and killed. Every single day. Recently, you had this man, was he the noob guy in Kawempe? They murdered right there on the street. And you guys, you don't even have sympathy nor empathy. Those are two characteristics of a civilized human being. You must have empathy and sympathy, and you ain't got it. Your people are being killed every goddamn day. And you are out there, dig it, dig it, dig it all the time. And then you fellows, Ugandans, you are still following these blind hyenas that are selling you to, to be slaughtered. That's a shame. It is in, incumbent upon you fellow Ugandans to wake up and stop this blind following because this is taking you nowhere and your people are being killed. And these people who are with this Abadehemuka, they have no sympathy or they have no empathy. I don't know who sent me something like that. He said, the parents of this man who was murdered at Makerere University because he was running for some local office there. How will they look at you when their son's life was cut short because he believed in you? We had one woman here in America not too long ago, when I say not too long ago, I'm talking about less than two years. She said, my daddy was a good daddy. Somewhere there in Arizona. The only thing my daddy did wrong was he believed in Donald Trump. What did he do? He believed in Donald Trump. And Donald Trump, being the biggest idiot America has ever produced, told the people that you can drink Clorox and they cure COVID. And the fool drank a Clorox because Donald Trump said it on television. And the damn fool died. And the young daughter said, my daddy was a good man. The only bad thing he did was to believe in Donald Trump. 
And people ask you, why, why do you tell people to drink Clorox? You know that because when you use it for cleaning the floor or the bathroom, it kills germs. So he thinks Clorox, if you drink it, is going to kill the, the germs that bring COVID or coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And the poor fool died. Now, how many people are following blindly? And they are not they are not they are not drinking products like this fool in Arizona, but they are drinking another type of products because they are being slaughtered every goddamn day. Yeah. By NRM tusis. When will this kind of human carnage stop in our country that we can have peace? and they ride around and they drive around and they enjoy a good life as human beings. When I was growing up in my area, I remember one night we wanted to get drunk and dance. We found that there was no fun in Chotera. We, we drove all the way to Masaka and enjoyed and they danced around four or five o'clock. We were drunk, but coming back to Vikira, having feeling great because we danced and they drank. Can that be today? We want to see Ugandans living a good, happy life. Have sympathy and have empathy. If you don't have any of those two, get out of the way because you are useless and dangerous. But on that note, hey, you know, all this, you've had it, you've experienced it, you've seen it. So the ball's always in our court to come to decision or to come to terms wherever whatever is bothering us. But from today's program, what I want us to take very attentive detail to is how organized these people are. Nothing is done off the whim. Nothing is done without coordination. And nothing is done without calculated results we need to also be that organized politically socially and militarily we need to be organized and in order to do that we must dust off the confusion because unless we don't if we don't do that the problem of infiltration and counterinsurgency will continue but that being said we're coming towards the end of our show today and I'd like to thank you so much, Senior Chitu, for bringing this here today and the conversation that it has facilitated for all of us to come to terms with what the political arena is, which we already know, non-existent. Everyone who's displaying themselves as possible candidates to a certain extent on a national and global level have really winded down into just puppetry. We have an understanding of that and know how it works, monetary funding. People are more concerned about clothes from Italy for a music video than anything else. Everything has become for sure, but we end up paying the price. So it's up to you to actually start to really think about these things subjectively, but also think about them and put them in context of right now. What's the plan of action? None of you even know what the plan of action is. I'd rather be in a movement or the group or just in terms of for us as we continue to liberate our country we should know what we should do and where we should press and where we should put pressure without having to really take that much money from our pockets in this inflation it does not cost 500 euros to find out what i can do to help in terms of pushing for liberation for uganda it does not cost 250 euros to facilitate such a discussion and even regardless if it if, if it's going to cost that much why not then let everyone come and put in however much they can afford because i'm sure then they could have had more people come and participate and air their views and voices towards this and where we take the struggle but let me not dwell much on that and those are those are other people's actions and they it's on their conscience and they would have to deal with the consequences but as it comes down to the national issues, let us accept that confusion has set in and we must really unshackle ourselves from confusion. 
the senior teacher, I'd like to thank you for bringing this topic, the discussion that it has facilitated, and for always being here to make things clearer and also to add all the knowledge that you have, you have and the experience that you've been exposed to, especially in terms of all the experience that you've been exposed to in terms of the historical background of Uganda trying to liberate itself from one inept regime to the next. But at this point in time, I'd like to invite you to bid farewell to our audience who have been watching us today. So the stage is on. Thank you very much for hosting this program today. In conclusion to all that we have said, I want to remind my fellow Ugandans that the time of bullshitting is over. We have to be prepared to remove this murderous regime by force or any other means possible. Unfortunately, we are not like the Ababega, which is a group of the Batusi who are notorious for poisoning. So we are not going to poison them because we don't know how to do that. But we can use any other means from peaceful to non-peaceful. But nothing is going to be short of flexing, uh, flexing muscles. We have to do that. And the sooner we embark on that project, the better. Otherwise, as people have said, every human life is precious. Tomorrow, someone is going to be murdered. And after tomorrow, another Ugandan is going to be murdered by the same people. And we are doing nothing. I haven't heard of any case, whether taken to the Muruka level or to the high court level, are choosing the murderers of murdering a Ugandan. And that is what pains me and it pains many Ugandans. We have to stop looking at these fellows who are working for this regime in disguise because they are the ones who are sustaining it. Maybe they are doing it unknowingly, but that's the outcome of the activities. My fellow Ugandans, get ready for action because that's the only option we have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Senior Chinto, for that. At this point, I would like to thank everyone who has been with us from where we started up to where we are now. And for all those who are going to watch the program after we go off air and you're going to watch a rewatch, let us send a message, let us let us put things into action, look for ways how we can actually be part of the organizing and organizing. We all know people, we all have networks, we all are part of the same community. Let us find ways that we can contribute to that and make sure that we can keep it at the same heartbeat. And then from there, we can lift up, we can get momentum. We've already had momentum, but it's us to continuously push that momentum uh, Pour, feed it with water when it needs water, ignite it with fire when it needs fire, blow it with wind when we need it to cool down. It's our job to ground it, cultivate it, and make sure that we reach our end goal, which is our end goal where we can practice full-on self-determination, we can restore our dignity, and have rights to our lands and resources, but also secure and maintain self-dignity, not only in Uganda, but in region as well as a whole and how by region as a whole of course i always mean africa and how we can make sure that never again does this happen not only to us but to future generations and also a big part of us a big part of all of this is keeping in mind that everything here is always going to take time yes kicking out kicking out the regime and we must prepare ourselves for a for a whole generation of unlearning and relearning and restabilizing even just our moral values. That must come as a package deal to wanting to liberate ourselves. Let us let go and start preparing ourselves for actually really unlearning all the bad habits that we have gotten not only from 
being a part of this structured nation Uganda by being part of regimes like this by proxy. Let us highlight our good attributes. I know I did talk about unlearning and relearning new ones, but let us highlight our good attributes like integrity, having integrity of any sort or kind of form in, a, in, in, in of every na any nature, and also being able to not stay in denial and accept the truth. That shows that you are ready to actually look at things for what they are, not for what they aren't. So, and briefly, I'd like to thank everyone who's been here with us. And we will be back next Sunday, as we always are. Please organize. And if you are not able to organize as of yet, take time out to learn more about federalism, learn how it will function in Uganda, and then teach the next person, teach the next group of people. Make communities of, of yourselves and where you go and teach to each other or to other new people. But with that being said, I want to wish you a good evening, good morning, good night from wherever you're watching this, and until next Sunday. It was a Mommy, no way, Mommy, no way, no Mommy, no way, Mommy, no way,